very glad to have this event here, this comfortable space. I'm Joanna Reuter. Welcome to all of you, intrepid souls. Be glad it was, it's not Monday night, because that was really bad. So I would say that my part in this game started most clearly 10 years ago in August of 2010, when Atul Gawande wrote an article in The New Yorker that was called Letting Go. I read it, and I had been helping people get organized before that. That was my, my business. I was breathing space, and some people knew me as breathing space. And I would find directives in people's homes, you know, under their piles as we were working on it, <laughs> pull them out. But um, when I read the article, Gawande was saying, doctors don't like to talk about death, and they don't do it very well. As a young surgeon, he was dismayed by his inability to talk to a young couple about what was really going to be happening in their near future. And so he was treating something he knew was not treatable. And so I read that and I was just sort of like, okay, this is what I need to do from here on. This is what I'm going to work on, is having people talk about this and get advanced directives done and know why they should and all that. So I started working in that direction and then sold my breathing space business. And in April, exactly four years ago, um, actually, Bob, my husband, I was sort of discouraged about what wasn't happening. And he said, well, what you usually do when you can't figure out what to do is go to the source. Why don't you go to Wisconsin? Um, I'd heard about Wisconsin because in the Gawande article in 2010, he noted that there was a town in this country where they had the most number of advanced directives completed. So I went to Wisconsin to do their training and discovered why it was so good and came back trying to find a place for this project. And that took a while. It took until September of 2015. And um, we got a grant approved, Hospice Brattleboro, Brattleboro Area Hospice got a grant approved for Taking Steps Brattleboro, which is a project with the goal of having every adult from 19 to 109 to have a directive. And Probably the young people may be the last on the, on the list, but not necessarily. There was a party recently, a 32-year-old had a birthday party and asked me to come and asked all her guests to come prepared to work on their advanced directive. It was fun. <laughs> it really was fun. Um, and there is now a new form for young people that's not as long as, as the, what's called a short form. It's specifically to name an agent who will speak for them and to say what they'd want if there was a serious illness or accident and they were looking at a, a future when they didn't know who they were, if that was, you know, or didn't know who they were seeing, talking to. So that's the agent form. Anybody can do it, but they're longer forms. And we have this project, we have at least 10 active volunteers at Breadwater Area Hospice who will help anybody who would like a little bit of help or a lot of help. It may just be, let me sign this with you. You know, be my witness, because we have, always have more than one person in the office or usually. Um, or it may be, I'd like to talk with you about this at length. So there's a wide span of different help. But that's what we have available. And I asked this panel to come talk about what they see with planning and not planning in their field. And I think that's it. Ready? And so if you'd introduce yourself and yep. carry on, it would be great. Okay. I'm Ed Burke. I'm an attorney here in Brattleboro. I've been 
an attorney in Wyndham County since 1985, solo practice in Wyndham County since 1987. Uh, that entire time, or at least since 87, I've been working on uh, wills and estates, and as the law has evolved, um, this area of healthcare powers of attorney and advanced directives. Back when I started 30 years ago, the issues that are covered by these documents weren't even recognized as an area of legal rights, responsibilities, or duties. I mean, in the last 30 years, we evolved, we, our local Vermont society, evolved to a concept called the living will, which was only in effect if you were in a terminal state. And that was regarded as radical groundbreaking to create a new area of rights duties and responsibilities. Um, but it very quickly became apparent that that was inadequate. Now that we were recognizing that there's a concern for how one is cared for uh, regarding health care decisions, to be limiting it to terminal care or terminal state situations, I still will never forget the day when a gentleman uh, with AIDS says, who's to say what a terminal state is? Who makes that call? And uh, not very long, that document existed for a few years, and then the legislature uh, saw uh, the wisdom of expanding that area of rights and responsibilities. And I'm going to use like exact terms just in case you want to, in fact, know what things are called. Advanced directives for health care, disposition of remains, and surrogate decision making. That's the name of the section of the Vermont statutes. Uh, and it was enacted in 2005. Um, you may know it. Of course, that's the full leg piece of legislation's name. You may have heard it referred to as a health care power of attorney. Um, and some people still call these, this whole area living wills. So there's, there's a bit of a blur. But advanced directives, health care power of attorney um, are the terms that you hear um, most often these days. Um, the health care power of attorney, even though that's what it's called, can also cover the other areas that are included in an advanced directive. Um, in short, says the lawyer, um, a description is the law recognizes that you have the power to name a person. You, the person naming, is called the principal. The person who you're naming is called the agent. And you have the power to confer on that person uh, a duty to effectuate your wishes as it regards your health care as it regards uh, the disposition of your remains, having your spiritual needs addressed. There's a whole range of issues that come under advanced directives. Um, the agent has, then has a duty and responsibility to see that your wishes are followed. And those who uh, encounter you in terms of your health care, uh, whether it's a doctor, a hospital, a residential care facility, a nursing home, they are also legally obligated to honor the directives that are set forth. Um, Joanna mentioned uh, the newest document in this evolution. Um, there's an organization called Vermont Ethics Network. And the document that Joanna was referring to uh, came into existence in 2015. And you can go online to Vermont Ethics Network, and I think it's brilliant um, because, um, pure and simple, all it does is name an agent, name a person to speak on your behalf without all of the uh, instructions on what you want to have done in this situation or that situation. And, what hymns you want at your memorial service. It's just, I can't make decisions on my own. 
I want this person to be making these decisions for me. Um, a lot of times in the course of my practice, um, and this has changed, uh, I think it's interesting, folks come in and the classic, I just want to do a simple will. Well, about five sentences into the conversation, there is no simple will. I mean, you know, family circumstances or whatever, and you get into conversation. And part of the conversation I always included was, take care of your advanced directives. If something should happen to you where you're not able to make decisions for yourself, whether short term, you're under anesthesia, or long term dementia, who would you like to be making these decisions for you? Um, and I hold their feet to the fire. I regarded that as something that they really needed to take care of at this point in time. It's very, very typical that people come in, they just want to get this done. I just want to do a simple will, and then you find out that, you know, life is more complicated than they realize. And, and part of the complication is they're more often than not, I regard it as one of the most important documents for them to walk out of my office with a healthcare power of attorney advanced directive. Yeah. I just yeah. say that, that the power of attorney is the same thing as the agent. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, so this new form that Vermont Ethics Network is, is putting out just has a person named. The per, uh, my less sophisticated clients, which were like all of them, and that's not meant to be in any way disparaging, was, well, when the time comes, I want them to pull the plug. Okay, how about pain medication? Okay, pain medication. And so I had my handy dandy one, pow one page, you know, when the time comes, pull the plug, and yeah, I want pain medication form. I expanded it over the years to include uh, maybe disposing your, of your remains and organ donation, but that was pretty typical. Now folks come in with a more, this conversation is getting around, it's like, I have thoughts about uh, DNRs do not resuscitate, and I have thoughts about this particular treatment and whether I want to go through it. And the Vermont Ethics Network, um, in 2011 started generating these forms that have different degrees of sophistication. The short form is like nine pages long, and I heard snickering it's short. The long is 26 pages long, but it's a lot of white space, let's be honest. But when I say 26 pages, I don't even finish the sentence. I don't get to a lot of white space, and the folks say, give me your one page shot or let me see the nine page. Um, okay, so what you really want to do is, as it's come to pass, it's been years now, I didn't see it as my role to discuss their medical circumstances and how they should be making decisions. It's been years that I've said, I want you to go first establish that you've got a uh, healthcare provider that you've got a good relationship with, meet with them, talk about what care you want, and come back, and we'll work that out. But I want you to have a really good conversation with your healthcare provider and your, and who you're going to name as agent, because this is really powerful responsibility. And um, and then as the hospice has has developed this program, the past maybe well, at least a year, over a year, I think, I've been saying these folks are really good at helping you have that conversation. And I've been referring folks to begin that conversation of how to sort out what they want and who they want to do it uh, with these folks. And all of the reports have come back to me very favorably from very different types of people, very different pers personality styles, have initiated conversations and gotten back uh, and executed advanced directives that I'm confident are meeting their needs, very important needs. Good evening, <clears throat> Bob Pertolani, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. great. Um, I wanna thank Joanna for asking me to be part of this, uh, this group tonight, this discussion. 
And I want to thank you all for coming, and I also want to praise you for being interested enough to come out tonight to hear this discussion. It's very important. Um, so this is tax day, or ta yesterday was tax day. Taxes and human death are two things that we're told we can depend upon. And I think they're both not very popular, if I'm correct. Uh, it's interesting that they uh, advanced, gave you one extra day this year to pay your taxes because they had a problem with their software. Um, we can do the same thing in medicine. Uh, and it may not be appropriate. I just want you to know that it's possible to extend life inappropriately, and it's something that's very important you all should know. I mean, we, we do have, we, we know that that's a possibility. So keep that in mind. Um, we also know that Barbara Bush passed on within the last day or so, and she expressed her desire not to be treated aggressively uh, to go home and to, and to die peacefully at home with palliative care. It's a choice she had. It's called that autonomy. She was able to make that decision. And we also all have, in our, if we're fortunate, we have the abilities to do the same thing. Um, we may not have that possibility. Something sudden may happen. And this is where we come to, uh, to thinking ahead, and I'm glad you're all here. I come to this with two things, and I'll be brief. Uh, I have been a physician in town here for a long time. Some of you know me for about 45 years, recently retired. Um, no one quite tells us how long we're gonna live on this earth, and I think one of the decisions we all have to make is when are you going to retire, when are you gonna do this, when are you gonna do that, and part of this is not knowing what the future holds for all of us. So I come from this from the perspective of long-term relationships with people. I've loved being a primary care physician. I've loved developing those relationships, talking to people about what things are really important in their lives, and trying to help them think about advanced directives about the conversations that they need to have with their families so their families are not left in doubt as to what they really value, what's important to them as they're it go, as they're having failing health, which is going to happen to all of us at some point. The other perspective is that of being on the ethics committee at the hospital. I was on the ethics committee for, as a matter of fact, I had the privilege of working with Bob Orr, who was the, pre, who was the, um, he was the chair of, of one of the first ethics committees in the northeastern United States, was right here in our little hospital. And he was a very, very important guy. He went on to become a professor of ethics and uh, at any rate, we've had a very strong ethics such committee here in this hospital. And one of the more painful things I've seen as part of that committee is to see families angry, angry with each other about trying to, in, in good faith, trying to help um, make decisions regarding their loved one who is not able to speak for himself or herself, who's, uh, and they're arguing with one another about what their father, their mother, their loved one would have wanted. So very, very important. I just want to say that the, the decision to have a conversation with your family, to tell them what your values are, what you would want, and in the, in the best scenario, spending time on an advanced directive uh, and so that you can express in as much de detail as you want, the more the better, uh, what you would want when you can't speak for yourself, either because you're unconscious, you're too ill, you're not competent, either uh, mentally or physically, not able to make decisions for yourself. Someone else is gonna have to do that for you. The more people that are close to you that you love that know what you want or have it written down, the better it is. It's extremely empowering to have that ability and it's something, it's a power that you need to use. Finally, it's a great gift to your family. The more you can express, the more you can, thank you, the more you can express to your, to your family members, the, the better that will be, and it'll, it'll remove some of the confusion that may result if people don't know. And people will come up with completely different ideas about what their loved one would want if they haven't had these conversations. So anyway, thank you again for being here and ask those good questions for us, okay? Thank you. So yes, uh, my name is Shabir Kamal and I'm a, a 
emergency room nurse here in Brattleboro. And um, so I'll just segue in from what uh, Dr. Tortolani said. And um, so we're kind of in the emergency room that with the challenge we have and also the challenge that patients have is that everything is done in a rush. Um, particularly if you're sick, um, you can get wheeled right in, you meet a nurse right away, um, someone's asking you questions kind of quickly, uh, you can have someone takes your blood, you have an EKG, off to x-ray, and you still haven't seen the doctor. At the point you see the doctor, often it, again, is in a rush. So my sort of recommendation or, or just my thoughts about this are, you know, have, I guess a couple things come to mind. Have a goal, have a philosophy. Um, that philosophy is going to be different at 55, 75, and 95. That's sort of a, a good way to think about it. Um, what what would you? What are your goals in life? You know, what in, not just in life, but what sort of healthcare goals do you have? You know, you may say, "Geez, I want everything." That's a great place to start with. Number two, in some ways, be prepared with what you know. If you have this philosophy, then sort of sit down and be prepared. R write it out. Look at these advanced directives and really think about it. Talk to the people you love. Which brings me to number three, which is prepare your family so that often times, even if you are in your right mind. When you're sick, particularly in the ER, you're often not feeling great. You know, you, you may still be thinking quite well, but you don't feel good. And that's a time when your family can come in, you know, an hour or so after you've been there and say, okay, you've prepared me. I know what kind of goals you have. Um, which leads me to the final point is that ask the doctor, ask the nurse, um, what are these treatments? How does that treatment going to mesh with my goals? And I think that's the place. A lot of people don't feel comfortable with that, but I think a lot of the ER doctors now are quite good at that and they actually welcome it. They, um, there's a new thing we've been trying to do here in the ER where we have like a whiteboard and as you come in some of the better doctors will write down after they've talked to you for a while they'll often say you know here's what I think you have. Um, we're going to do some research and then they write up what the research is. Okay we're going to get a CAT scan. We're going to do an EKG. We're going to draw some blood work and at the end I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about what I've found. Um, I'm guessing, and they'll even say this, I'm guessing you'll probably have to stay the night or two in the, in the hospital. And they'll kind of, and I think that's the point at which people will start to say, what, what would happen if I didn't, you know, go through with this antibiotic that you're, you're recommending? Or, you know, I think that's something we don't always allow ourselves to do. And I think that's as, even as nurses are getting better at this, we're, we'll often say to the family or the patient, hey, you know, do you have any questions for the doctor? I'll be in the room with the, the patient and the doctor and I say, you had a question for me earlier. Like, why don't you ask the doctor that now? So I think being prepared is, is great. And I'll, I'll end on a, a story that to me is, is a positive story. It was a, um, I had a nursing student who was following me for the day and we began right at 7.30 at the beginning of our day with an elderly woman who was, who had an amazing family. She had an advanced directive and she said, I, I just want to pass. And we walked into the room and she was basically quickly dying there. And I just said to the family, are you guys okay with this? Have you chatted with the doctor? And they said, yes, we are. And I said, well, all right, well, let's, so I just sat down and I had motioned for the, the nursing student to sit down and we sat there and we talked. And at some point they said, when will we know? And I said, well, you know, at some point she'll stop breathing. And then she did. It was 15 minutes after we had gotten there. And we just sat there for the next 20 minutes, listening to them tell us the story of their mother amazing woman she had been and it was a very poignant moment for everyone for me for the nursing student and particularly for the family who had that moment and they had in my mind the woman obviously had prepared them they had prepared themselves and I think it was a, a poignant end. and it also felt like a gift to us because instead of rushing around doing needless things we were able to sit down and take the time so in, in a way it was a, a real gift to us to be there at her last moment so thank you it's so great to listen to all this. Thank you, Brattleboro Area Hospice, for putting it together. I'm Cindy Jerome, and I'm the director of Holton Home and Bradley House, the two residential care homes for elders in town. Um, I love the language that I've heard you start using recently, Joanna, where you talk about an advanced directive being a gift to your loved ones. It, that is so true. So I'm coming from a different perspective, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget anything. So. Families need help when a loved one is dying. It can look scary. The person who's transitioning into death, their face can change. They'll make unusual breathing noises. The body loses interest in eating and drinking. If there's no one there to explain what's happening and what's normal and what to expect, it can be uncomfortable. Of course, in the hospital, you have that. 
and in a home like Bradley House or Holton Home, you do too. In the midst of that, some families are at odds. There can be complicated relationships between siblings, with the other parent, with the person who's dying. Conflicts around what to do can arise. Having an advanced directive is such a gift. When somebody moves into Holton Home or Bradley House, we ask for their advanced directive and we talk about it. Not necessarily right away, but we find that a conversation about it with the resident and their close family members is a tremendous opportunity. It normalizes talking about death. We talk about decisions that have already been made. We support and empower the elder who has made those decisions. And sometimes we find that what's written doesn't necessarily express what they really want. It may reflect what they think their doctor wants or what their son said, but then we can help them set it right and make sure it does represent what they want. There is such a thing as a good death. I know you'd all agree with me on that. And it's much more likely when you have advanced directives and you talk to your loved ones about them. In the end, it's a beautiful thing to be able to focus on the person who's dying, on their comfort and their experience, their favorite things, and to support the family. We can educate them and help them process what they're going through, and we can reassure them that they're doing exactly as they should, honoring their loved one's wishes when there is an advanced directive that they can follow. The nurses and aides at Bradley House and Holton Home are just amazing. Let me brag for a minute. I want to tell you a story about a man at Holton Home. I'll call him Walter. He had a major stroke. He couldn't move or communicate. His advance directives were clear, and we brought him back home to, to Holton Home for the last few days of his life. The home's cat seemed to know exactly what was happening. You may have read about that kind of thing. And the cat just spent the next several days nonstop on Walter's bed, and the aides positioned the cat just in the right spot so Walter's hand could rest on his warm fur and feel that. They angled the bed so that Walter could see his favorite paintings whenever he opened his eyes. And they know that hearing is one of the last senses to go, and so they would turn on his favorite TV show every day at 4 o'clock so he could hear that. And they kept him clean and dry and comfortable and cared for him with love until he passed. I want to give you one more story, this time about a resident at Bradley House, and I will call him Carl. Carl knew that he was getting close to dying, and he knew exactly how he wanted it to go. He had his advance directives in place. He had an ongoing conversation about it over time with his daughter and with the Bradley House nurse. I remember the joy he felt about those conversations. He was in control. He had defined and made an amazing life for himself, and now he was making choices about his death. He had agency, and he was using it, and that mattered a lot to him. So Carl chose to tell everyone to come visit, including all his friends at Bradley House, and then he became weaker, and he stopped eating and drinking. When that happens, the aides usually use glycerin swabs to keep the mouth and the lips and tongue moist and comfortable, but they knew that Carl was a beer connoisseur and that his favorite beer was Otter Creek Double IPA. Can you guess where this is going? Yeah. When Carl stopped taking fluids, they started swabbing his mouth with Otter Creek Double IPA. And every time they did, he gave a big smile and as long as he was able, a thumbs up. And it was a good death. I thought you were going to say he was made a, a miraculous recovery. <laughs> anyway, my, my name is Michael Tomanick. I'm a funeral director here in town. And uh, how many here are scared of dying? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> you know, Woody Allen once was quoted as saying, uh, I'm not scared of death. I just don't want to be around when it happens. <laughs> but of course, I want to die when I'm 90 years old in my sleep. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, I get the people uh, usually... Uh, from Bob Tortolani or the ER or nursing home that uh, have been given the bad news. There's uh, usually the type of client I see is uh, uh, an elderly person who uh, they're going to be admitted to a nursing home and uh, they need to do a spend down so the family uh, comes in with the individual and meets with me to go over the type of services uh, they'd like and, and prefer. Uh, another uh, option which is a, a, a sad one that uh, I, I uh, have difficulty dealing with is when somebody young has been diagnosed with a terminal illness 
I just had a young lady come in here within the last month who, uh, in her mid-40s, uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer and said, I, I need to make my arrangements. I've, got, I've been given two or three months to live. And uh, so this is a, kind of a sad, uh, uh, the different types of um, uh, cases that I get uh, between the estate planning, um, those with a terminal illness, or some that just, uh, they reach a certain age, they, uh, for financial purposes, they want to come in and, and prearrange their funerals. And basically, uh, it's a fairly easy procedure with me. It takes usually two visits. Uh, I have a family or individual come in, and um, it's an information gathering session where I get vitals on them, uh, the type of services they might be interested in, what faith they are, uh, get information for an obituary, and then uh, discuss the type of services they might be interested in. And then we draft a use of a quote for services if they want to prepay and put funds aside. And uh, uh, they select merchandise, a casket, if it's going to be a traditional funeral, an urn for a cremation. Uh, Sometimes it's an anatomical donation to UVM a School of Medicine. Uh, so uh, and then a, a, a second visit where we do up contracts. Um, and there are several different vehicles when one prearranges. Uh, either uh, pre neat uh, a trust, which I use exclusively in my business. Yeah. Did, did my battery go? Yeah. Uh, the funeral trust uh, insurance, or uh, some individuals uh, put funds aside uh, in, in their, uh, their own bank account uh, earmarked for uh, end of life services. Uh, some individuals don't prepay at all, they just want their wishes down on paper. Um, and uh, to, to be kept on file. Uh, then when the time does come, their family will take care of the expenses. Of course, many folks, they, uh, they want to make sure that uh, their specific services are taken care of. I, I just had another lady come in here within the last couple of weeks, uh, and she explained to me, she said, you know, if I don't do this, I don't think my children will, will honor my wishes, so I want to make sure uh, this is done the way I want it. So she, we had everything put on paper, and. Uh, um, she took care of her arrangements that way. Uh, and this is a growing trend. Uh, more and more people are uh, prearranging their funerals. I've seen a big increase. I opened my business uh, uh, in 1991, and um, uh, pre-need was, was, was in existence, but all of a sudden in the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years, it's, uh, it's a big part of my business now, not only at need funerals, but uh, meeting with families who are gonna uh, take care of their arrangements in the future. Um, um, and again, I, I make house calls also. Most people will come to my facility to, to make arrangements or uh, uh, I'll go to uh, somebody's home if they're, uh, they're in uh, homebound and, and make arrangements in the comfort of their, their home. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. I hope uh, somebody has some questions on, uh, that we can answer. And I, I've got a comment on, on I've been to uh, Bradley House here, uh, I think three times in the last two weeks, and the facilities are, are beautiful. So it's almost like being at uh, one of the Disney resorts with that new <laughs> dining room there. So, great, that's where I want to go when I'm elderly. So, I'll sign you up. Yeah, you thank you. Too. Okay, thank you, uh, Joanne. You're welcome. Thank you. So, this is my thought um, it's to take a stretch, a moment, and the three people standing in the back are all volunteer facilitators at Brattleboro Area Hospice, part of the Taking Steps project. If you will give them your questions, we will get them up to the panel here and start hearing answers. I thought, so we'll try it. This, I've never done this before. I'm going to see how it goes. And all can be adapted. But we have a good mm, 50 minutes, I would say, to hear some rich, not yet, um, questions. And after, at the end, we actually have some handouts, just a few for you to take. One of them is a resource list, and they're really great resources now. I mean, a lot of work has been done to change this conversation, to make it so people are more comfortable talking with their families. And I'm always saying, you know, this is a family thing. Because I have young people come to me and say, I can't really, I don't want to talk to my mom. You know, she's going to think that I'm trying to hurry her up. 
you know, and then I'll have an older person say, well, my kids don't want to talk to me about this. They just say, you know, you're going to be, no, you're, we don't, you're going to just last forever. <laughs> and so given that anybody over 18, 19 and up needs to have a directive because there is no automatic person who will speak for one after you're 19 or after you're 18. So um, one of the first workshops I gave, it was uh, John Seacrest who said, college students need these directives. So I just say, well, go home to your family and say, we all need to do this. And that seems to work quite well. You say, let's, you know, don't worry, don't worry how old you are, how old I am, we just need to get this done. So, um, I have some questions and I'll be happy to collect yours, but I really mean it. Stand up because it's healthy and wiggle for a minute. And um, if you can give your questions to any of the volunteers. Okay, I think we're going to gather again um, and start hearing questions. You probably will have more questions as you hear questions. So we'll start with the ones that are written and go from there. How do you choose, okay. How do you choose or obtain the correct wording for what you want? Who would like to? Well, I will. <laughs> yeah, because what we really do, when we work with somebody, we have a lot of time. It's not on a clock. And so we help people Think about what they want. We, what we say is, let's write down your questions so that you would want to ask your doctor. And let's write down, do you have any questions to your faith leader that you want to go discuss? And who do you need to discuss with this with in your family? And does your agent, agent which is the same as the healthcare, um, durable power of attorney for healthcare, it's exactly the same person, just a different name, um, have you talked with them? So people go leave us with a list of questions or a list of tasks that are laid out and then we check, you know, how's it going? And so they would go and say, so how do I say this? You know, this is an example, I would like a breathing tube for pneumonia but not a terminal situation. So interestingly, actually on the di new directive, you can say, I would like this for a short amount of time. It's one of the check boxes you can check. I would like a breathing tube for a short amount of time to see if I'll get better. And so check that out first. So that's one it's sort of language that's already provided. Do you have anything else to, on that question? No, it's very appropriate. I mean, I. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. It's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, um, you can actually in Vermont, according to the article that you uh, had in the paper, um, and I didn't realize this until I saw that article, you can actually write a narrative uh, in your own words as to what you would want. But I think taking advantage of the uh, of the time at the Brattleboro Area Hospice and going over these questions in great detail is the way to do it. In the hospital setting, the hospitalist would, would uh, meet with the family or the patient if the patient's able to express it and have that conversation. You are in a situation where it would be a good idea for you to have a breathing tube because your oxygen is so low and in order for you to breathe better and get rested and not have to struggle to breathe, we'd, we had recommend a breathing tube uh, temporarily to see if you get through this. Now, the patient may not want to have a breathing tube for more than a temporary period. I think that's the way a lot of us are. If we think we can get through, if there is a possibility of getting through an acute problem, I think many of us would choose to have a temporary invasive kind of treatment if the, if the reward were good health again. On the other hand, if you go three, four, five days, you're not getting better, then you could make the decision to take the tube out and be treated with palliation, basically. 
But that's a decision that can be made by the patient, if he's able to speak, or by his surrogates. Or if you have a document, it would state that. I, I think it's always good to have both. Conversations with your family, with your physician, caretakers before this happens, and also um, have, it on, have it written down. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the things come, a lot of discussion comes about uh, feeding tubes also, you know how long one would have a feeding tube. Again, many people don't want to, their quality of life depends upon their abilities to take food in their mouth and swallow it normally. If they can't do that, they don't want to live. That's a decision that each one of us has to make. On the other hand, a feeding tube may be appropriate to get you through an acute illness for 10 days, five days. That's, that's the kind of decision. Mike, yeah, there's a lot of devil in the detail, devil in the detail here. And uh, I think if you have a caring family, if you thought this out, you have caring practitioners, and we have many of them in Brattleboro, then this can be worked out. But we want to respect what people want for themselves. We also want you to get better if there's any chance. And that's where the, it's a little murky, a little tough. The more questions you ask, the more detail you have, the better it is. Um, I want to touch on this from form's point of view, and I don't know if any of you fall into this category, but a heck of a lot of people, human nature or whatever, feel like they have to fill the form out as it's presented to them. And so we're talking about having really good conversations with your healthcare provider and with your family. Um, but when it comes time to like filling out the Vermont Ethics Network short form, there isn't really space specifically identifying that kind of temporary situation. The 26-page form, in fact, does. There's an entire section this big of what circumstances will cause this to be temporary. Um, as I say to all my clients, this document, whether you're using the short form or the really short form, can be amended in your own way. And this is why I think it's so important to have converse guidance with like the Brattleboro Area Hospice. So people who might be inclined to say, well, I, d I have to either check yes or no at this place, when in fact the answer is more nuanced, like when the condition, this condition ceases, please cease the treatment. Trained uh, people will help folks manage, uh, navigate these forms much better. I think that's a huge uh, benefit of the service that is now provided in this community. I mean, a co conversation with the doctor, conversation with the family, but you hit the form and, and you're not seeing anywhere to address it. Uh, some navigation would, I think it's a really essential piece of this whole process. Thanks, Ed. Oh, I guess I don't have to carry that. No, I'm already hooked up. Okay, um, this one I'm just going to jump in. Is the short form the same as, advance, as the advanced directive? Which does Brattleboro Area Hospice use and why? Okay, so um, what used to be was just the long form. That was what existed. And the goal is to get people to use these. And people would look at them and they would go on the pile <laughs> faster. That's the problem with the long form. Um, so there's still the long form. It's still legal. In fact, in Vermont, you can write your wishes without any form at all. And it is a document, as long as you have it, signed by two adult witnesses at the same time as you're signing it. So you don't have to have a form. You don't have to have an attorney, because part of, the, part of the goal is to make this as accessible to people as possible. And even so, it's hard to get people to get this done. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so the short form is an advanced directive. It's just that particular size. And actually, when you take out the instructions, there's only six sides that... <laughs> But, um, and we, we have all of these available for someone. They come in, they can say, I really, we've had a few long forms done. 
but not that many. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, the screen lights not staying on. It doesn't. Okay, then it's the, I think just turn it on and it stays on. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. okay. It's on? Okay. So, uh, to demystify, I printed out copies of the new really short form, what's called the short form, and the long form, just to demystify it for you folks. Uh, yes, anybody can do it. You don't have to plug into these forms. If you use these forms, you can annotate away in it. You don't have to fill out every category. Uh, you don't have to fill in your favorite you know, the hymn you once sung at your service. I mean, there's things that you just don't have to do. You can do it yourself, but there are uh, requirements. The Vermont statutes, the one thing to keep in mind is who you're naming as your agent cannot be the witness, nor can, and I printed out the all the, Basically, okay. family members of the agent can't be a witness either, including by marriage. So other than that, two witnesses with that limitation. And uh, yeah, you could scrawl something out on a piece of paper, but I did want to get that limitation out there. Right. Um, some of you may remember, you may have actually worked with Ray Walker, who was the sole pioneer in this area for a long time. He was the person to go to if you wanted an advance directive help. Um, and he used to say, well, you know, if the UPS man is there, I'll ask him to be one of the witnesses because he qualifies. So you just, you just need two adults. So I've gone to a neighbor and said, I have somebody, can you both be witnesses? It just can't be family. Um, the other thing is that we, because we were getting confused ourselves between these forms, we've ended up calling the, the little one the agent form. So we say there's an agent form, a short form, and a long form. So it's not quite as confusing. Okay. There's a lot of questions here, so here we go. Which is great. Talk about, yeah, I'm really glad for the questions. Talk about when to stop food and water, and could you talk about DNR? Talk about when it's appropriate to stop medication. Let's go to the medical guys. Well, I think um, Barbara Bush, when she said she didn't want to have any more extreme treatment, was not precluding um, oxygen, for example, and pain medication, uh, or medications that would, um, if suddenly stopped, she would die quicker. Um, I think in general, once a person makes the decision to not have active treatment, uh, pain medications are given even if it may shorten that person's life because the entire, uh, the entire goal is, is comfort. Uh, so Barbara made that decision um, a day or two before her death and I, my, my guess is that she stopped routine medications in general, non uh, nothing that was not for pain or for, for oxygen, for comfort, and all the other medications were stopped. She was able to eat and drink, um, and that would be it. I, um, or, ordinarily, if a person makes the decision that he doesn't want to have aggressive treatment, you don't use antibiotics. You just use pain medication, oxygen. You don't use IV fluids because that actually increases the pain. Uh, you use oral medications, lip, lip uh, moisturizing, anything for comfort uh, once that decision to go that way is made. And hopefully it could be made so that you're in your home. And when, uh, when, that is, when it was said, uh, home, home is indeed a home, that is really that person's home, absolutely right on. But I think uh, in the perfect world, dying at home is a great thing. We have very good hospice organizations in the community. And um, I, I think more and more people are choosing to die at home if they can, and I'd encourage that. I would add, Joanna, that if um, you're wondering about when to stop eating and drinking, it's entirely up to the person who's dying. If they're thirsty, you bring them something to drink. If they're hungry, you bring them something to eat. Um, but you may not want to bring full meals to them when they're not telling you they're hungry that can complicate things and make people somewhat more uncomfortable 
So you follow their lead. They're in charge. They can tell you what they want. Okay. Let's uh, switch gears. Can you give a brief overview of the different alternatives available in Vermont? For burials, caskets, green options, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, years ago, is this on? Years ago, it was uh, either a traditional funeral or a, a cremation. Today, uh, there's uh, many, many options. Um, visitation, um, a traditional visitation at the funeral home, with a, followed by a church service, uh, visitation with a graveside service, just a graveside service, cremation with a memorial, memorial service. Um, pretty, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, a lot of customized services today to match, uh, you know, the individual's um, uh, preference. Um, nothing's really cut and dry anymore regarding funeral <laughs> services. I gotta say though, there's been an increase in, in cremation versus uh, traditional services. Uh, when I opened uh, my business in 1991, I think the cremation rate was around 18 percent, and today it's about 70 percent. So that seems to be the more preferred uh, method of disposition: cremation with a memorial service or a, what they call a celebration of life services, which you can have at uh, at a church, the funeral home, a, a hall in town. Uh, some families have gone up to the Kiwana shelter on a, a nice spring day and had a service up top there with a, a cookout to follow. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's changing. Um, that, that was my question, and um, I'd like a, a little bit more detail if you could about, um, I was witness to a, a death that happened in the home and then the body was washed there, um, not taken for embalming. Um, so there, in Vermont, especially, I'm aware um, to some degree that there's many options like that and, and wanted yeah. you to elaborate on Yeah, and bombing is not required by law. A lot of people don't realize that. In fact, before uh, we can uh, do a procedure, uh, we have to get uh, preferably written permission before we embalm a body, uh, if not uh, verbal permission from a family member. But um, yeah, I, I, in Vermont, I think it's one of the few states where you can take care of your own debt. In fact, I think there was a book written on that by... Uh, uh, Lisa Carlson up there, who was the uh, head of the Memorial Society. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, some families uh, will take care of their own, uh, or have the uh, the hospice wash and dress the remains, and before we get there, um, some keep the uh, the bodies overnight. That's happened here within the last year or two. They, I'll get the call uh, in the in the uh, afternoon or evening, and the family will say, "Geez, we'd like to." sit vigil with the remains through the night, can you come tomorrow morning, um, which, which isn't a problem. Um, also, there's a group that's working, um, just gathering at this point, around the green burial idea. And if you have lunchtime available on Monday, this coming Monday, there's going to be, at the River Garden, the lunch bag, brown bag talk is going to be about green burial. Um, Someone who has been exploring it for her own family and has information. Yeah, I, I've gotten a few inquiries lately. Not not a, a, a lot of inquiries on green burial, but there seems to be a growing interest. I think uh, Vermont's uh, still uh, in the process of getting an official green burial cemetery somewhere, where it's, uh, all the graves are marked out with a GPS system, no no stones. Um, I know Meeting House Hill Cemetery does have a, uh, a section up there for uh, a, a green burial where uh, they don't go down quite as deep with a casket. A vault is not required. These are the bodies put into a, an alpine uh, orthodox type casket and buried that way. So there's a, a website um, that's NHFA. <laughs> Natural or something Home Funeral Association. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of information on there. So, um, yeah, they're using wicker baskets for caskets now, or a trundle type device where the body's put into a shroud. It's like a, um, a pine base with handles that the body's buried, uh, buried in that way. So you don't need a casket per se, but uh, some type of device at least to transport the body to the, the place of uh, final. Uh, disposition. And if you want to see example one, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. 
um, go by the Chamber of Commerce window. In there right now, there's one um, grapevine woven casket, and there's also a cardboard one that some people got together and painted. And that's also an option, particularly for if someone's being cremated, because they're going to be in that kind of, they can be, right. yeah. Um, so that's just my, my quick. Joanna, the um, <laughs> website is homefuneralalliance.org. Thank you. And I haven't seen that, but I would expect that they are reflecting what the Vermont legislature passed in legally uh, permitting uh, green burials, but there are parameters set out in the law. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, it's recognized, it's legal. There are some parameters. I mean, I won't get gruesome or anything, but it's, there are some parameters that the law requires that I would expect a website would be honoring and aware of. Okay. What are the five most helpful things a doctor or ER nurse needs to know in an emergency situation? <laughs> okay, I might not be able to limit myself to five. No. <laughs> um, in an emergency situation, I think the wishes of the person who that we're taking care of is probably number one, really. Um, yeah. I guess what, what's, what's often important is to have the conversation in real time. So people can change, they can change your mind. Um, the circumstances are, there's a lot of details. For example, if you say, I would like to have a tube to breathe for me, well, there's some details. That tube often can stay in your mouth only about two weeks, thereabouts, and then it starts to erode your lips. At that point, we become more aggressive and put it in your throat. Well, that might be just the perfect information you need to know and say, okay, well, two weeks sounds about reasonable to me. I don't know if a, if a month sounds reasonable to me. Same thing with feeding tubes. We can actually put a feeding tube alongside the breathing tube or in your nose. Again, that's a very temporary, non-invasive thing, and it can last for a little while. But again, then after a while, after a while it starts to irritate your nose quite a bit. The next step would be much more invasive. We actually go in through your, the wall of your stomach and into, you know, that way. Again, that would, for a lot of people. So I'm not sure it's hard to say what the other five, thi what other five things, but certainly what the person wants. Uh, what do they know about the diagnosis? That often is really important. Um, you know, is this something that they've had for a long time and they know it very well? Is this something that just happened newly and we're discovering, oh my gosh, you have answer. You didn't know it. it um, it's very aggressive. It seems to be over a big part of your chest. This doesn't look good. That's the time that, that, that I guess you know, we can start talking in real time. And I think, so I would say asking for detail, ask detail. Really, you know, and I think most, most physicians these days are very happy to give you that. If I don't do this, what would happen? If I do do this treatment, uh, what would happen? So those are important. Great. Thank you. Um, this one is, I want to change my advanced directive. Is there a short form or is it a do-over? So what there is, is a, and it's again, it will be on your resources list. The Vermont Ethics Network, who's been working on this since 86, has all kinds of forms. And there is a form that is a change of directive form. So if you're only changing a part, you can use that form and, and you, have a, you can say this is a change. Or you can do a whole new one. You want to make sure that the people who you gave it to the first time get the changes. But w it's expected now that a directive will be looked at. It's not something to put away, far away. That every five years or so, not 10 years, but actually five years at this point, take it out and know where it is, you know, and say, oh, well, let's see, does this still fit? And let me ask my doctor, does this still fit with the condition I have now? Or should I, should I change it? Uh, one thing I just want to mention is that we are also, um, we have copies of something that just came out in the New York Times, the article about it. And it's called, it's a dementia addend addendum. And there's been a lot of concern from people about what about dementia, because it's not covered in documents that already existed. Um, so this addendum is, was worked on for three years by a doctor and whatever, teams and so forth, and has been approved. What 
the truth is, is that it has not gone through court. So we have yet to see exactly what will happen with it. But it does now exist, and you can pick up a copy and, you know, and learn more about it. And it gives different stages of dementia, and I would want this or I wouldn't want that at these different places along the way. Um, and for some couples, it's really important when one person is the caregiver and the other one knows that this is coming along, that they really have a conversation about what's this going to look like in our lives and how are we going to deal with it. So, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is such an evolving area. This is one of those areas of law that is, has a cutting edge nature to it. And the issues that were coming up that the legal community and the medical community, I'm sure all of, all of a whole, was you've given an agent power, you're, you've been diagnosed with uh, deme on, dementia on, coming on, and a concern, the time comes, you're, you're allowed, and I, you know, I've spared you tons of particulars of this whole scheme, but you can still disagree. I mean, you can give an agent authority and still be making your own health care decisions. That's a immediate, when you set up immediate agency. And, um, but there comes a point, as many of us may be familiar with, of, of when the person is not making the best decisions and the agent is trying to uh, exercise what they've been told to do in the advanced directive and the principal is now arguing with the agent about what they executed. And in the long form, this is what really in my mind sets it apart from all the other forms, is this waiver of the right to request or object to treatment, which basically, and, and it's reflected in the statutes that all of this is based on, is should I come around to disagreeing, I'm waiving my right to disagree with what I'm creating now. And obviously that's a pretty serious waiver to be engaging in and should only be undertaken in very special circumstances like there is this diagnosis of dementia and there is a pretty strong likelihood that this situation may be encountered. So if you have that kind of situation, hmm. you may really, this is by far and away um, unique from all the other advanced directives provided um, and the law that provides for this is very demanding because it is such an incredibly powerful waiver. But it is a circumstance that the law and the medical, legal and medical communities were recognizing as something that needed to be addressed. And so, uh, just so you know that that exists. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we have this project is that this is not, it's not a cinchy thing to figure out. And it takes lots of thought for some people and lots of contemplation. Um, one of the books that I have on the resource list, still at the top of my list, is Being Mortal by Ato Gawande. And, but there are lots of others. <laughs> there's a shelf full here and there's many more than that. Um, there are more coming out all the time also because people are concerned about this. Um, I can't remember when that, it was about two years ago that there was a national bipartisan committee that did a 650 page report on what was happening at end of life and they recommended that we make it better. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd just like to speak about a couple of challenges as we're talking, as if we don't all have enough challenges. But there are a couple of cultural changes that I, are, have gone on in the medical profession in the last 10 to 15 years that I think are important. One is that um, because the primary care physician is not generally in the Northeastern United States and many parts of the United States taking care of his patient in the hospital, it, it's all the more important to have an advocate, um, to, have, uh, to have family members 
reminding the hospitalist physician, who is the physician who will take care of you in the hospital, uh, who the primary care physician is, whether they have advanced directives. The primary care physician may not know the person's in the hospital for one, two, or three days. I know the primary care physicians try to visit their patients in the hospital and keep the communication lines open, but it doesn't always happen. It used to be that the primary care physician you know, took care of them from the emergency department, through discharge into the nursing home, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore in most parts of the, at least the urban United States and even rural New England. It doesn't happen very much anymore. The other thing is we talked a lot about talking to your physician and as you all know when you see your physician, that physician is under incredible, incredible time restraints, constraints. It really annoys me that uh, the physician-patient relationship is being impinged upon by time pressures, by technologic pressures, differences in technology that get in the way of the patient and the physician seeing each other eye to eye and having body language uh, well recognized. All those things to me are very, very important and you can certainly demand if you really have these questions regarding end of life issues, you know, and you don't have enough of time for that appointment, in that appointment to address them, set up another appointment or a long appointment a month from then uh, because there are, one of the good things that's happened is there are coding. Codes are important for, for physicians to have some reimbursement and there is coding available for people to talk about end of life issues. So it's always important to have an advocate with you whether you see your, your healthcare professional in the office. Having someone go with you is very important. We don't always remember what happens in the doctor's office and, and particularly with this transition from the emergency department to the inpatient, from the inpatient to the nursing home or to uh, aggressive physical therapy. All those things, it's so important to have advocates with you. We don't have that routine 20, 30 years ago, same healthcare professional doing it all. Very important to know. Okay. So the, there's a, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, um, I don't think I've seen the same doctor twice in the last two decades. <laughs> The turnover is, is, I mean, every time somebody says to me, you need a relationship with your doctor, I give up. I think that's a problem. It's a terrible problem you've had. I think your experience has been particularly bad. Um, I think the, the culture is changing now. Private practice is becoming increasingly difficult to, to honestly do. It's uh, to afford. Physicians have a very difficult time, and I'm sure attorneys have a difficult time running the small business that we call a private practice. Okay? That's the reality. It's very difficult. And a, a newly minted physician is not going to try to do that because he'll fail or she'll fail. They, they become employed by a larger organization, and that larger organization has a lot of power over who you're going to see when you go in. You may start with one person, and that person may go to another town, or there may be three or four healthcare professionals in that office, maybe 10, and maybe one of them that day will be seeing acute patients or coming in with an acute problem. Um, I, I am so sad that this is happening because I think the most important thing is a relationship with a healthcare professional ongoing. And I would keep trying to find that one person who is going to, it, it's hard, it's really hard. But don't give up, okay? Okay, we have a few more, and I, I bet there are lots more questions. So I just want to put a plug for um, Taking Steps Brattleboro, our project. You know, there used to be at Brattleboro Area Hospice, there was um, hospice care during someone's death and helping the family and then bereavement help afterwards. And this is just the piece that was missing in my thought. You know, we needed something before, something to look far into the future and hopefully not need it for a long time. Yes, Larry. Okay. Um, that one we got, we've done really well. So there's a thing about, I'm sensitive to medicines when dying, I'd like to be treated with remedies recommended by a homeopath. Um, would this be possible if I end up in a hospital? 
Uh, <laughs> well, he's speaking better at No, I can tell you. Yeah. I can tell you the answer is um, it would be very difficult to do that because the, the medications would not be available and the healthcare professionals would be uncomfortable with giving medications they're not familiar with. That is a very difficult problem. Uh, and I understand entirely if there's any possibility of making the decision to go back home, if you were able to do that, I think that would be the best thing. You'd have much better control over the medications if you were home. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Being at a place like Holton Home or Bradley House, you can do that. You can do medical marijuana as part of your comfort care plan. Um, so there are options. Okay, the lawyer in the room says. <laughs> Just don't tell him. <laughs> the statute, there is statute, and I printed out that particular statute in terms of obligation to honor a person's wishes. So if you have staff who have a moral pro whatever the problem is, uh, the providers, the healthcare provider, the residential care provider, is legally obligated to uh, hand that over. Now that's the law, the reality, the law and reality don't always mesh, but there is an obligation on those providing services to uh, meet the, the person, the principal's wishes. Yeah, it, 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 it really clashes with the hospital formulary, what's on the hospital formulary, with the comfort the healthcare professional has with that. Now, if, if your other healthcare professional, the, the naturopath, could somehow be involved, and that person, I think, could be involved in some way with the hospitalist, I think it could be worked out. It's not impossible. This is Vermont. This is, we can do things. But I'm saying, in general, the, the formulary in the hospital and the comfort of the healthcare professionals taking care of you have to be respected. So I would like um, just a little bit of information about an ethics committee and what that is and how it works. Sure. I, I snuck that in uh, about the hospital ethics committee. I, I think I have somewhat of some pride in the fact that Brattleboro Memorial Hospital had one of the earliest uh, uh, ethics committees in this part of the country, well before Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and as far as I remember. and. Basically, this is a committee that talks about uh, the, the rights of the patient, uh, things like autonomy, um, person being able to speak for himself, what, what is, uh, when, does that, in a, when, when is that person no longer uh, legally able to do that, uh, who's going to speak for him. Uh, it, the committee is a committee that meets monthly. It, it, it consists of healthcare professionals from the hospital, including uh, nurses, physicians, therapists, etc., as well as lay people from the community, uh, clergy, uh, legal. Uh, there's an attorney. There's clergy. It's it's very well represented to get a broad spectrum of the community and dealing with all kinds of issues around ethics. And then we have as part of that committee called an ethics committee consultation, clinical consultations, where two or three people from that committee. Uh, have the responsibility to go to the bedside when either a family member, a nurse, or a, another healthcare professional asks that a, uh, a, a particular situation is looked at from the standpoint of the ethics committee to see if you could help solve some of these very difficult problems that occur when families disagree or when there's a disagreement among healthcare professionals as to how to handle a certain problem. That's where, the health, that's where the ethics committee gets involved and gives their opinion. And that opinion is not binding, it's not legal, it's simply a, a, another opinion from an objective group of healthcare professionals. So. Thank you. Is there any last question out there? Yes, Larry. Could we spend a little time talking about <coughs> trauma death mm. or trauma injury? So on the highway, how does a first responder and the ER know what your wishes are. Uh, this is difficult. I think it's an area that needs improvement. Um, if they come to your home, a lot of people will put a DNR or some sort of thing on their refrigerator. That's been a common practice for many years. It's very informal, so you might put your medication list and a DNR in the fridge. 
EMS will often look there first before they leave the house. If you're by yourself in a car and you're unresponsive, then that becomes, we basically do everything we can until told otherwise. Um, so that can be real difficult. In places like France, they do, and I don't know if it would cover trauma or DNR, but they have a card. Everybody carries a health <laughs> card that has your allergies, your medications. Each time you go to your primary care doctor, you hand them your credit card and they swipe it and it updates wow. whatever they, they said, oh, I'm gonna put you on a new blood pressure medication. I'm getting rid of the old one. Give me your card and I'll update it. That would have, I'm guessing, something like this. So I think there's plenty of room for improvement because that often is something we get where we're like, we don't know. So we have to do everything until we otherwise told. So just one thing that there is, is a, which I don't think we've talked about tonight, which is the Vermont registry where you register your directive. It's part of the form that says I'm sending this to the registry and the ones that I have have the registration registry on top. It's just a simple thing, but you get a card back that goes in your wallet. You also get two stickers and when a nurse told me, put one of those stickers on your insurance card because that is always looked at <laughs> in and a I, medical situation. My understanding is that we are trying to make that electronic because it is, it, it's housed in electronic form for, in the state of Vermont. So we can go, you know, but in an emergency, that often is not the case. What they're trying to do in the hospitals across Vermont and other places is that if I opened your chart, it would give me a flag immediately saying this person has their advanced directive housed at the state. And then you'd, I could then go and look at it quickly and say, oh, wow, I have all this information that I could bring that to the doctor. So that is something in the future, hopefully. And the, the thing about the, it's a national registry, actually. Just okay. to plug Vermont, Vermont pays for your uh, registration. It's $59 for someone paying individually. And Vermont has a contract so that everyone can do that. And then the registry sends you, the registry sends you a, a letter that says, do you need to update anything? And two little new stickers in case the old one got worn off. So they're, they're, they're really working on trying to make as much, help as much as possible. And when you're in another state, and I'll, I'll come right next, if you're in another state, a provider can look at that health card and there's a phone number to call. And it actually, there's a, there's a 24-7 person answering that phone. Um, they also answer regular questions on, from nine to five. But if a provider calls, there's somebody who can look in the registry and give um, and send out, fax out that document. And I've experienced it right here, where an agent didn't have the form. And so I got the data and called the registry and they said, okay, you guys can do this, and you can send it to you, and he had it in his hand. I, yes, you're definitely well, raising it. Um, when you talk about registry, and for them to get information, that has to be very specific, such as allergies or organ donator. It's on our driver's license that we're an organ donator. Right. But do you check that at the hospital? That's almost a separate entity altogether. There is a, um, a New England organ bank that we're required to, to notify if either somebody is critically ill and not looking like they're going to make it or if they, pa they pass away. Do they have that from our driver's license? It, we do, but we're required to call them 100%. Well, I understand. Yeah. Call yes, we were. I don't know if they really work on that. Oh, absolutely. They take it very seriously. So the New England organ bank is, is um, they, then they will, con they, all they ask from us as nurses is can you just give us the next of kin or a contact information and then they take it from there and then they'll walk you through it if, if you know and they actually ask that we not approach you because not being professionals in that so but then um, our family has a very bad penicillin allergy and if a person's unconscious and their family's not around was that does this direct to have anything to do with it. No. I, mean, I guess no. you should really, they don't have a place on our uh, driver's license to put that, which they really need to do. What we do often in the years, we will give people, there's a card in your primary care, we, a lot of most hospitals will hand out these cards and you put it in your wallet, it's a wallet sized card that has all your medications and allergies. So we encourage people, hey, I'll often give them to people in the year, hey, I've got this card, you don't have one? Huh? Why don't you fill it out or I'll fill it out for you. And at the very front it says, 
uh, no known allergies or allergies to penicillin. So that is one way you could, you just keep it in your wallet. That we do often look for that. Yeah. yeah. We, don't, we don't make that available. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's not yeah. Okay, I think we're close to closing time. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that you will pick up whatever information you want on your way out. I hope that you'll call us um, and keep the conversation. Just having you here and having these folks here just reminds me it is possible to talk about this. <laughs> and the more we do it, the more it will become possible. There was a grandmother who used to say at Thanksgiving, she'd clink her glass and say, no pie until you each tell me how you want to die. <laughs> So, <laughs> there's a prediction. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you, panel.